So um, for the last five years, I've run a program called Seed Wayne um, in Wayne, at Wayne State's campus. And it's a campus community collaborative to build sustainable food systems uh, on campus and in Detroit neighborhoods, in working in partnership with campus entities as well as community partners. And um, uh, these last five years have given, given me an opportunity to, to think about what universities can do in terms of offering leadership for sustainable food systems and also what the limitations are of university roles. So I love this picture. Uh, it's a great image of, uh, of, a, of a really handsome young man um, eating salad in a, in a public setting. And it's, he's eating it on the go. So this is fast food. Um, and you know, I mean, I think more and more men are eating salad these days. But there's this, um, this stereotype of salad sort of being a women's, a women's food. And this man is breaking all possible stereotypes. He's, you know, he's eating it in a public setting. And he's, he's just gotten it from one of the vendors uh, at our market, Brother Nature. And he's, he's walking. He's busily walking as he's eating. So, um, so I, I think in, in it captures what we are trying to do. Um, with our farmers market on campus, and I, I can speak more about that. But in terms of a roadmap, um, I'll talk about universities and, and why universities should ex exercise leadership in sustainable food systems. I'll talk about our program and its various activities. Welcome. And then um, I'll talk a little bit about the lessons in terms of um, the advantages of the university setting as well as its limitations. So why should universities lead sustainable food systems? Um, I've, so I have four sort of major rationales. And um, one is, uh, you know, we're increasingly learning. The mind is connected to the body. A healthy, a healthy body makes for a healthy mind. We all know that. And of course, we pay attention to that in school, uh, K through 12 settings. But the connection doesn't end when students enter college. And universities um, should make available healthier options for food. Uh, but, but if you go to any campus, you'll see the same uh, types of food outlets that you see anywhere else, you know, fast food, foods high in salt and sugar. And I feel that universities have a special responsibility given the knowledge that we have about um, the fact that the food environment matters. Uh, when people don't have access to healthy food, they tend to not eat healthfully. Um, and um, universities, too, have other responsibilities. They are civic. Uh, institutions and they have anchor roles. Um, so universities have a purpose other than, um, uh, you know, just educating people for employment. Um, they have a, a leadership role in building citizens of the next generation, of um, you know, uh, imagining better social arrangements than the ones we have right now. And also universities, because they are such big, uh, they are big institutions and have big footprints they can play important roles by leveraging their resources to improve their surrounding neighborhoods and the region. And this is especially the case with urban universities, such as Wayne State University, which has explicitly an urban mission. Um, so for example, in the hiring decisions they make, in the purchasing decisions they make, in the investment decisions they make, universities have a lot of power to improve the, their surrounding neighborhood. And that's, that's an anchor function that um, institutions of higher education can play. Um, universities have significant buying power in terms of their dining halls. So for example, a, camp, a campus the size of Wayne State University uh, could spend anywhere up to $2 million just in terms of dining services and their catering services for conferences and things like that. And the $2 million can impact local farmers if it's spent supporting the local farm economy, or it can go outside, um, you know, uh, as a lot of food dollars do, do go outside from the state. But in addition to campus um, food purchasing decisions, there's all the people on campus who are buying food. So for example, the average um, uh, resident in the US spends um, just over uh, $1,200, uh, $1, uh, no, $2,100 on food at home. So, so let's say, OK, so on, um, on any given day, we have 20,000 people on campus at Wayne State. So the, uh, the farmer's market that we operate runs for five months. And let's say people would, per would spend half of their an you know, annual um, expenditures for the food that they buy at home if they spend it at the farmer's market for five months. That would be just over $400. 
So let's say out of the 20,000 people who come to Wayne State, let's say 10,000 people buy half of their food for the five months from the farmer's market. That would contribute $4 million to small uh, local small farmers and locally owned food businesses. And of course, when you support locally local small businesses, the multiplier effect is higher. And that money, which otherwise may have been spent at a Kroger, for example, would have got left the um, would have left the state, but then, you know, if you spend it at a farmer's market, it stays. So in addition to the food that's provided in dining services, we really should think about how we can leverage the buying power of the people who work there and the people who go to school there to create benefits for the surrounding community. And of course, I mean, Wayne State has, um, you know, if you consider the income of people who uh, work and go to Wayne State, it's, it's, it's probably higher than the average uh, resident of Detroit. So we could provide benefits for the surrounding community and people uh, who live in the neighborhood. So that's, um, so we, universities need to think about the power of the money that they have, both in terms of their pur purchasing decisions, but also in terms of the people who, who work there. Um, and then, of course, universities are uh, centers of learning and innovation. Um, sustainable food systems are connected to every possible discipline. They're connected to economics. They're connected to uh, urban planning, my own field. They're connected to public health. You know, practically any field you can think about, sociology, anthropology, political science, engineering, you can uh, identify a connection to sustainable food systems. There's a lot of very good research coming out of universities and so um, universities should think about that role in terms of producing knowledge through research and academics um, and in terms of innovations more, again, strategically to create benefits. So these are some of the rationales for why universities should think about their leadership role more uh, self-consciously and strategically. So um, now going to my program, um, Seedwain's mission is to collaboratively build sustainable food systems on Wayne State's uh, campus and in Detroit neighborhoods. And the key word is collaborative. We have about two FTE employees. Um, and when you see the range of activities we do, you kn you'll, you'll know that we don't do it by ourselves. We do need the help of other campus and community partners. And the idea is to build these sustainable food systems by linking to all of the university's functions, teaching, research, engagement, community engagement, uh, and operations. So what do I mean by sustainable food systems? I can offer an entire class on this or take the entire hour that I have uh, to speak to this, but I'm very quickly, I wanna say, you know, when we talk about sustainability, we typically talk about the three-legged stool, um, economy, environment, and social equity. So those are the three E's, and of course those are built here. But in addition, um, I've added the, the, uh, the other E of community engagement. Uh, we, so in terms of ecologically regenerative, we want to have a, a, a food system is sustainable when the natural uh, resource base upon which the food system depends is not depleted um, and that it's continually uh, regenerated so that we're not depending on outside chemicals, for example. We're not fouling our water bodies um, just to be able to grow food. We want to make sure that the, the resource base upon which society depends is alive and well for future generations. So how we farm, how we transport our food matters. Um, we want our food system to be socially equitable. You know, people shouldn't be able to eat healthy just because um, they can afford it. Everyone should have access to healthy food. Uh, it's a matter of equity. Um, by virtue of being human, they should have that. Um, it should be economically empowering. Right now, a few corporations control um, many aspects of the food system. And that's problematic because it's so, food is so vital um, to our, our health and our community's health. And so, um, uh, you know, we should think about how, how we can rearrange our food system so that many more players are empowered in terms of wages as well as in terms of business development and entrepreneurship and the contributions that businesses make to the community and the region. And then finally, we're all stakeholders in the food system. We all have should have a voice uh, in, what ha in decisions about the food system. And right now, uh, we don't. We essentially are at the mercy of uh, what's in our grocery stores and 
um, you know, what the ag, ag bill decides uh, where the subsidies go. And subsidies, for example, go to five major commodity producers. Can you name, I'm gonna, since we have two, we can do a little bit of uh, interactive conversation. Can you name which five commodities get the most subsidies, our taxpayer dollars? Subsidies. subsidies. Uh, well, I'm, so talk about, think about raw materials. So crops, so okay, let's say corn. Corn that uh, goes to feed, um, feed animals. Anything, any other commodity crops that you can think of? Wheat, soybeans? No, rye doesn't get the most subsidies. So it is um, uh, soybeans, wheat, corn, rice, and blanking on the, no, um, it'll come to me. Um, but anyway, they, they're, they're, you know, and this is, this is what our food processing um, industry, this is raw material that is very highly subsidized, um, takes advantage of, and that's why processed foods are so cheap, is on the one hand, you know, they're being, they're being subsidized by our taxpayer dollars. Um, so I'll talk about the three main activities that are highlight, that are bolded, and I'll just briefly touch upon other activities. So Seedwain has activities on campus on the left-hand side column and in the community, which are indicated in the right-hand side column. And then we have some cross-cutting activities um, that uh, span both campus and community settings. Cotton. So uh, corn, soybeans, wheat, uh, rice, and cotton. Um, so this is our first garden that we built on campus, um, established in 2008. Um, it's, it, it's a tiny garden, and really, it took a while to build it because um, administrators' facilities would not give us permission. You know, there was, they, they had all kinds of excuses for why um, we shouldn't build it, and then finally, in 2008, we were able to persuade them with some high-level help. And so we built our demonstration garden because we want to show what's possible with very little land um, in a campus setting. And um, you can see the before picture was completely lawn. And then in June of, uh, in June of 2008, we built those beds. And uh, there's a happy group, um, you know, somewhat dirty uh, after all the work they did. And then, um, you know, it is now a very, um, it's an active, um, you know, hub for people to pass by and visit. And um, administrators will sometimes bring their guests to campus. And as part of this garden, now we've expanded last year to create a winter garden by building low tunnels. And you can see the frames that are built in the top slide. Um, and we built those in February so that by Earth Week, which was the last week of April, we were able to harvest salad greens that we offered for tasting in the cafeteria. And this year, we just brought all our participants together and had a big potluck. And we had several, actually a couple of hundred pounds of salad greens uh, in these winter beds. So again, the we wanted to showcase the possibilities for growing uh, through uh, the cold season, um, you know, because Michigan's growing season is just five months. And, but you can do more. You can do more uh, through these um, uh, hoop, cold frames and hoop houses. Our second garden was established in 2009, and it is, it's an allotment garden. So students and employees will lease beds. Uh, students pay a rate of $10 per season, and employees pay $20 per season. And um, you know, we have, right now we have about uh, 45 to 50 people registered uh, to garden here. And uh, this is in 2009, April 18th, a nice, a really nice spring day. And, and students are, uh, the people who helped build the beds are having a well-deserved lunch break. Uh, I like that slide very much. Uh, and then, uh, you know, a month later, more, just over a month later, we have some beautiful uh, greens and, and harvests that are coming ready to harvest. Isn't that, look at that salad greens, those uh, lettuce. Isn't that beautiful? And our third garden is the uh, rooftop garden on uh, parking structure five. We, we have three beds, and they have a polycarbonate roof uh, that gathers its own rainwater, and we ha that's captured in the rain barrels. So the polycarbonate roofs are butterfly, you know, they're angled towards the center, and they, the rain barrels capture the water, and then we have a drip irrigation system so that um, in, a, in a typical Michigan summer, we should be able to have enough water without having to bring water from the outside to water the beds. Um, in a dry season like this year, we've, you know, we, we would need to bring water from the outside. 
And it's a really, it, you know, it's a very attractive destination uh, for visitors because everyone is very interested in seeing how you build a rooftop garden. Um, we use the parking structure because we were, you know, it, most buildings are not designed for rooftop gardens, uh, and there's a lot of liability concerns, whereas the parking structure is designed for occupancy. And so we were able to persuade our facilities people to give up one parking spot for our rooftop beds. The farmer's market, uh, this is our fifth year. Uh, it's still ongoing. Have you, either of you, been to the Wayne State Farmer's Market? Uh, well, I would urge you to go. It's on Cass, just north of Warren, 5201 uh, Cass Avenue. It's across from the Detroit Public Library, uh, if you know where that is, the main branch on Cass. And it's every Wednesday from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. And uh, it's a 21-week farmer's market, so it's, it's five months. Um, and uh, we have a variety of uh, products, fruits, vegetables, honey, eggs, um, lots of processed foods, breads, desserts. We also have lunch vendors, people who, who offer hot prepared foods. So we have, for example, soups and wraps and sandwiches and even hot, hot crepes that are prepared right on, on the spot. Uh, and it's really quite a bustling place uh, during lunchtime when people come out, and especially on a nice day and have lunch. Um, we accept all the government nutrition programs that farmers market in, markets in Michigan can accept. Uh, for example, we take the bridge cart. It's very important for us as part of our um, the sustainability principles, the four E's, that we um, ha our market is accessible to low-income households. Um, so we accept the food stamps, which is now called SNAP, Supplemental, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. And, um, and then we match SNAP spending dollar for dollar uh, through a partnership called uh, Fair Food Network. It's called the Double Up Food Box. And so when someone spends $10 on their food stamp, on their bridge card, we give them 10 extra dollars with which to buy fruits and vegetables, Michigan-grown fruits and vegetables. So that, that's a win-win-win. It's a win for the households because they get more money to spend um, on fruits and vegetables. It's a win for the vendors because they now get more sales as a result. And it's a win for us because instead of going to the grocery store next door, they're coming to our farmer's market. Um, so that's, that's been a really good experience. Last year, uh, combining food stamps and the matching dollars, double up food bucks, we, uh, we got a revenue, we got our, th those two parts uh, essentially accounted for $25,000 of sales at our market. So, you know, clearly, I mean, it's, our sales were quarter million dollars. So it's a small percentage, but it's an important component because it's a service that we're providing to our neighbors. And most of the people who use their bridge card who come to our market live in the zip codes uh, immediately, either zip, the zip code of the university or the immediately neighboring zip code. So it's clearly providing a, a benefit for the neighborhood. And then we accept Project Fresh and Senior Project Fresh coupons, which are the farmer's market nutrition programs that are uh, administered by the state. We offer a lot of uh, cooking demonstrations. In fact, this coming Wednesday, our executive chef will do a cooking demo at the market. Uh, so if you, if you want to come there, this is a good time to come, come at noon. Um, and we also offer a tabling where we um, talk to bridge card recipients, especially about, we engage them in conversations about, you know, how, how they eat and the challenges they face in, in eating healthier. And, you know, provide them with tips and have conversations about how, you know, what they could do to move to a healthier diet. Um, and we give them resources like um, kid-tested recipe books because it is hard. If kids are finicky about eating, it is hard to assemble, um, to buy healthy food, uh, and, and, and try different things. Uh, we give them measuring cups, cutting boards, um, refrigerator magnets so that they know to keep the refrigerator at the right setting because you, know, you just have, sometimes you have controls that say one, one through five. You don't know the temperature. And so if you have a thermometer, you, you can adjust your control so that you have the, the, uh, the refrigerator at the right temperature. Um, we provide a lot of recipe information, se seasonal guides. So when someone comes and says, oh, where are the peaches? We can give them a handout that says, you know, exactly when peaches come. And so they, they understand, they learn more about Michigan agriculture. Um, and, and so we, there's a lot of educational activity that happens at the market. We, there's, a, there's a lot of art and entertainment as well that happens at the market. We were part of the, on the top slide, we, we were part of the My Apple art project uh, that gave all farmers markets in the area a big apple that we could then essentially personalize. And so we worked with the art school and we had a competition 
and the student that came up with the winning design got to design this apple cart that was at the market for all of last year. We had performing art um, by the Mosaic Youth Theater. They offered three performances at our market this year, and also Inside Out Youth Poets. And actually, last week, last Wednesday, we had a pop-up band perform. They just came in, they plugged their equipment, and they sang two songs, and then they left for another location. So the market is really a very important, it's a place to get healthy food, but it's also a sociable place uh, with uh, educational opportunities and, and entertainment. You can come in and, you know, just hang out with your friends for, for an hour during lunch, and, you know, you can go back to your office charged. Recharged, not charged, recharged. Um, and then this, this year we got a grant from the Michigan um, Economic Development Corporation um, to fund a shuttle that links eight senior housing complexes in the Midtown to the market. So we have essentially two routes that are repeated twice uh, to bring seniors. And that started August 1. So we're still, you know, we're, we're still working the kinks out and figuring how that works. But uh, uh, we have some really good partners in Midtown that have helped us um, develop that program. And then we have lots of young people. You know, you would think that on, a, on campus uh, you'll only see working age adults and, or, or students, you know, st older students. But we get lots of young people because uh, area schools and kindergartens, uh, you know, classes will bring their students for their, their kids for a field trip. We have young people working uh, as interns, for example, for the Grown in Detroit Cooperative or for, you know, for other vendors. And they come to the market to learn basic skills, um, you know, in, in terms of, how do you package, how do you merchandise, how do you talk to customers, and so on. Uh, and then people, young people volunteering. The kid on, at the bottom is a, is a child of a colleague of mine, and he was visiting his father, and so he was put to work in the, in the market, and I think he enjoyed himself. And so those are our major projects on campus. Of course, there's a lot of other things that I'll touch briefly on. Um, as well. This is our community project called Detroit Fresh, and we received a grant from the Herb Foundation to work with corner stores in Detroit to help them carry fresh fruits and vegetables, or carry more fresh fruits and vegetables if they already carried some amount. And um, the way it works, and, and so that's, I'll talk about that, and then we also um, worked with the Capuchin Soup Kitchen on the east side to build a 4,000 square foot passive solar greenhouse that now um, is a site for season extension as well as training, agricultural training for young people and adults. Um, so this is our um, corner store program, Detroit Fresh. Uh, that is Mr. Bo Barden. He had, it's a tiny, tiny store on the east, near east side. And um, he, they're having some health problems now. So they're participating very, uh, only inconsistently. But um, this was the shelf that greeted you as soon as you came into the store. And of course, you, you know, it had only chips and, and uh, other things, pretzels and things like that. But they cleared the top two shelves uh, to put baskets of fresh fruits and vegetables. And um, we have, the, that's a Harding party store on the right-hand side. And then uh, a and is um, one of our better stores. It's at Mac and Dickerson on the east side. Most of the stores are on the east side. So, uh, and then this past summer, we worked with them and through a partnership with ArtsCore Detroit, we connected ArtsCore with the store and they have painted a mural. And if, I don't know, I don't know where you work, um, but if you're on the east side, you should definitely check it out. It's at, at, at Mac and Dickerson. So, um, we, the way Detroit Fresh works is we spent about a year um, just going, driving through neighborhoods, going into the stores, assessing them. You know, what do they carry? Um, if they carry fruits and vegetables, what is their experience? If they don't carry fruits and vegetables, why not? Um, would they be interested? You know, we recruited them. And we did, we surveyed about um, more than 220 stores. And then of those stores that were interested in partnering with us, we would then provide technical assistance. So what is the layout like? Where should f fresh fruits and vegetables be, be displayed and merchandised? How would they put them away for the evening uh, to store them? What kind of signage should they have? How should they price it? Uh, what kind, we provided them with flyers, we provided them baskets, in, some case, in one case a shelf, in another case a refrigerator. Um, and then we connected them to a distributor who would distribute product for free or at a nominal, for a nominal fee so that they could then just place the order uh, and then the distributor would come. So, um, so we didn't need to be part of that once they were connected to the distributor. And then once they were set up, we would, our staff and volunteers would go 
um, you know, a few blocks around the store to conduct outreach uh, in the neighborhood to tell people, hey, you know, did you know the store now has fresh fruits and vegetables? And if there's something you want to see, let them know as a way to really renew the connection between the residents and the stores because oftentimes, you know, there'll be residents who won't go into the store because it doesn't carry anything they want or there's tensions between the store and the neighborhood because, you know, the store is selling what? Mainly what? What is a store economic model? So liquor, cigarettes, what else? Junk food and lottery. That's the major economic model that these stores uh, depend on. So, you know, so we want to, I mean, uh, we understand the, you know, the history of some neighborhood relationships. And in some cases, people are dependent because, you know, they buy alcohol on a regular basis and the store might give them credit or, or whatever. Um, so, the, you know, we want to shift the relationship towards the stores um, being responsive to community needs and the neighbors feeling they can ask for things that are really good for them. Um, and so, and then we also did outreach to partners like churches and neighborhood organizations, really to get them engaged in helping lead some, you know, some conversations with the stores so that the, the store becomes more responsive to the neighborhood. And we don't always have to be there in order for the store to be responsive. So we have, we started when, um, for the entire span, we had about 25 stores participating and then some stores dropped out because they changed ownership or they closed or um, didn't, they didn't want to participate. It's a lot of work. Produce is about uh, the hardest work, at least with dairy and some other things which are perishable, there's a date, you know, and you can manage it. But with produce, you really have to watch it on a daily basis. And as you probably know, I mean, most of these stores are, you know, the, the owners are behind uh, bulletproof glass and you know they don't have to come out and uh, you know the the soda guy and the liquor guy will just come in with their truck and bring things in but for produce you have to be uh, you have to be managing on, a, on an active basis so we have 18 stores um, of different of varying sizes and actually our phase one of this phase that I talked to you about ended in June so now we're looking at all our evidence to figure out what our next steps should be and um, if you're interested I can tell you a little more about it in Q&A um, with gas stations, we have two gas stations participating. Gas stations, it's harder to carry vegetables because people are coming in for snacks. So it's easier for us to shift, you know, instead of buying a candy or a, or, or a chip, you know, you buy a banana or an, or an apple or an orange. Um, we, we, tr we talked about possibly having ba baby carrots or, or um, cut um, celery or something like that, but that, it, the distribution of of processed foods is harder, um, and so we we kind of left that because we couldn't we couldn't accommodate that in the in our first phase. Um, most of our stores are located on the east side, and uh, three are African American owned. And you know, I mean, to be honest with you, this has been a, a really eye opening ex exercise for us because it is a lot of work and. It's not like they're making a lot of money out of produce. So, you know, why are they doing it? Um, in some cases, they're worried we'll report them if they don't carry fruits and vegetables, if they have a WIC, like, uh, a WIC agreement, for example. So, um, in some cases, they want to provide service to the neighborhood, but, um, you know, uh, and so they needed a little bit of the nudge from us and a little bit of the support. And so they, so, um, but they're finding that, you know, um, Demand for produce varies by season. There's more traffic in the warmer months than in the colder months, so you know, so their performance goes down when it gets colder. Um, it also varies during the time of the month. So when the bridge card, the food stamps come in, there's a little more traffic, so they have to they have to watch the traffic. And so um, some stores are inconsistent. Some stores are much more on top of things based on on the traffic and the demand they get. And then in partnership with Detroit Fresh, we realize that it's you know, as important as it is to provide, to make available fresh fruits and vegetables, it's also important to engage people in conversations about healthy diets. You know, what does it take? Uh, we don't want uh, the households to be buying all of their produce in the corner stores. It's just not a good, it's not, it's not efficient, it's not economic. You know, it's better to buy all your produce from a you know, store where you can get good discounts and good sales. But if you're, buy, you know, if you're assembling a sandwich and you need a tomato or a lettuce, or if you're, instead of buying snacks, uh, you know, a, a chip bag or a cookie, you, you know, you buy fruit. So it's about shifting, it's about small quantities of, of produce. Um, so we, in partnership with the stores, we offered um, healthy food fairs. We offered six of them this year, and where we had cooking demonstrations with products that you could get from the stores, like, you know, convenient, quickly assembled recipes. Uh, we offered lots of resources, you know, we, 
water, apples. Um, we provided lots of um, games for the kids and engagement, you know, conversations, interactive conversations. We don't want to beat people on the head and say, eat more fruits and vegetables because, you know, a lot of people know they should be eating healthier than they, than they are. I mean, I know I could use some, some, you know, reminding every so often myself so I don't eat as much ice cream as I do. Um, the, the question is really looking at what challenges do people face? Um, how, can, how can those challenges be overcome both by their own changes inside their household but also changes you know, in the community and through policy. So those conversations really help us understand the constraints households face in eating healthier. And it's a good reminder. You know, we all need to be reminded. I mean, in, in the barrage of advertising that we get for junk food and, and fast food that is, you know, highly processed, um, we don't see as many ads for, for fresh fruits and vegetables. So we, we need more reminders to include more uh, fresh fruits and vegetables in our diet. Uh, we have lots of community partners. I won't go through all of those, but I will just say, for example, that Earthworks Urban Farm is an important partner for us. They uh, help us with our gardens on campus, uh, provide technical assistance to us, and help us shape our research projects. Eastern Market Corporation is the fiduciary for our food stamps because the university has no experience with uh, taking food stamps. Uh, and so when we wanted, when we approached the university and said, hey, you know, we'd like to be able to be part of the food stamp program, the university said no because they didn't know how many, you know, what kind of sales we'd have, and you know, writing a check uh, cost the university money, and they felt that those costs would not be justified. So we went to Eastern Market, and of course, Eastern Market has a mission to serve underserved communities, and so they were eager to partner with us. And so, when the bridge card is swiped at our market, and we take money out of the bridge card, it gets deposited in an account that Eastern Market uh, runs. And then when we redeem the tokens, uh, at, you know, we give the tokens. We give tokens when we um, you swipe the bridge card and ask the customer how much money they want. And they spend the tokens in the market, and then we redeem them from the vendors. Eastern Market cuts them a check based on our receipts. So it's a, it's a really, I mean, it's it's a unique partnership of the kind that I don't know exists anywhere else in the country. Um, and then, you know, Detroit, Greening of Detroit, we're part of the Garden Resource Program, so they supply us with seeds uh, and transplants for a very nominal fee. And um, the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network is a very important partner for our educational activities and for our field trips. So very quickly, I'll go through some other activities. Um, we work with our chefs. Our chefs support our farmer's market, and they also um, will sometimes showcase our garden products when they assemble, you know, catering meals for important VIP guests and say, you know, these are, this is, these herbs, this thing was made from, by, you know, with herbs from the Wayne State, the Warrior Garden, or tomatoes, you know, were gotten from the garden or whatever. And they also source from local farmers. So they're, even though we, and we have connected them to some farmers, um, they have, you know, they have a director who's very committed um, to these goals. We compost um, kitchen wastes from, uh, campus cafeterias uh, from dining halls. We uh, support student uh, peer, peer educational activities. So if a student wants to offer an activity, we will provide them with resources. So for example, this is a rain barrel construction workshop where the students essentially did all the training. They, they, they did all the work to prepare themselves and then they offered a workshop and we essentially funded uh, the supplies for that. And we offer, um, you know, we, we fund, uh, we hope, we support student participation in conferences, and we also uh, invite uh, nationally renowned and internationally renowned speakers to campus to offer lectures that are re very well attended by community partners and community guests. We offer a field uh, farm tour every year, and this year we visited five, five stops, including two community farms, Earthworks Urban Farm, and a very uh, interesting community garden project in Flint, Michigan. It's called Harvesting the Earth. It's associated with a karate club. And we also went to West Wind uh, Milling um, Company, which is the oldest still functioning flour mill in Michigan. And we went, visited a commercial apiary that's run on sustainable principles. And we visited an orchard. Uh, we were really interested in the orchard because as you probably know, this year was difficult for, for fruit trees. Um, because we had a warm spring, and just as the flowers were coming out, we had a like you know a f deep frost, a deep freeze for like three or four nights, and that just completely decimated um, tree fruit trees. And so we wanted to know how the farmers were coping. 
Um, we write a quarterly newsletter. The, all these, you can get the information and download the newsletters on, on Seedwain's website. If you Google Seedwain and then click on the newsletter button, you can get all of our archives. So you, you'll see the progress uh, our program has made starting you know, June 2008. And um, of course, we are also very interested in uh, helping policy -ish development in the city and um, state and federal levels. So um, I helped write the Detroit Food System Report, which you can download as well. If you, do, um, if you just write um, Detroit Food System Report in Google, and you'll get to it directly. So um, because part of this learning um, objectives is to understand why, you know, I mean, we have, this is, Seedwain has been successful. Five years, it survived five years. We've offered very successful programs that are well. We have good participation by students. The farmer's market is well attended. Um, and, and, you know, here are some factors. I mean, um, the people who support us on campus, the administrators, the faculty members, and the students appreciate that the opportunities that the program is giving the university community and the surrounding community in terms of um, the ci it, it extending the civic mission of the university. So they, they support us because they understand that the university is more about more than just offering classrooms you know, in four walls, that the university is about more than that. Um, they appreciate all the engaged learning, the hands-on learning, and other innov you know, innovative learning opportunities that the program provides to students. And so they support us. Um, they, you know, I mean, Detroit, Detroit, I don't know how much you know about food systems nationally in Detroit, but Detroit is considered a leader in a lot of food system work in terms of urban agriculture. And, and so the people who support us on campus and our community partners appreciate that what's going on on campus is really an extension of this movement that's being built in Detroit. And they want to see that. They see all the exciting things going on in the community, and they see, OK, well, Seedwain is trying to connect to that and build that on campus. And, you know, and, and um, we, they know that you know, when we offer classes, we're extending the mission. So we're helping them um, you know, with, with, uh, extend the mission of the university, the core mission of the university. And the fact that you know, we've, had, um, we've had a garden built, uh, and then the next year, Michelle Obama wanted to build a garden on White, White House, you know, on the White House lawns. And you know, we offered a farmer's market in the next year. They offered a farmer's market. I mean, so this, is, this has become very visible. And so our accomplishments um, really helped cement some support early on. So for all these reasons, um, the university, uh, you know, Seedwain is successful. And the university understands uh, how Seedwain fits it in the context of all that the university does. But it's not been easy. Um, Seedwain represents a departure from how the, what the university does and how the university works in a variety of ways. And so we've faced challenges um, at practically every step of the way, including building our first garden. Um, there were all kinds of arguments why we shouldn't build a garden. You know, oh, you want to, you'll build it now, you have you'll be enthusiastic now, but the students will leave and you won't take care of it, or, you know, or it'll, be, it'll create a mess and it'll make the campus look dirty and all that, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, or there'll be rodents and infestations and so on. Um, so, you know, everything we did represented, an, a, you know, a new, a new way of working for the university, you know, I mean, food stamps, for example. I had several conversations, and that was one thing where I didn't win. You know, the, the VP for finance said, no, I'm not going to do it, and that was that. Uh, but some other things I was able to persuade and build support, and if this person said no, I'd go to this other person and make a case, and they would talk to them, and, you know, and doors would open, but there were some things where it was just not possible, and there were just too many challenges. So here are some continuing challenges. Uh, university is a bunch of silos, so it's hard. It's, ha it's hard for faculty to cross boundaries because they're rewarded in the boundaries. They're not rewarded for crossing their boundaries. And so even, even among faculty, there are silos, let alone you know, between academic and other functions. Um, so that, that's a problem. Um, the university is increasingly, I mean, there's been severe cutbacks in budgets from the state. So the university is increasingly forced to pay for everything. So you can't, if you ask for the university to do something, they'll say, well, how are you going to pay for it? So, um, and that's hard because when you're starting a new program up that doesn't have a lot of support, where you can't raise funds because you're, you don't quite know what you're doing, you want to try some things out, um, it's hard. You can't just ask for support because you have to pay for it. 
And that is creating a lot of challenges because the university is becoming very bottom line in, in everything that it does. Um, growing so season versus academic calendar, for example, our gardens. You know, we start the gardens with great enthusiasm in April and May and the students, you know, and then this, it, it becomes stable over the summer because the students, you know, are not taking classes and they're nearby and so on. But once fall starts and the harvests are coming in, you know, their schedules change and they are all over the place and the harvests sit in the garden and it, it creates uh, problems for us because sometimes the harvest will just walk away. Um, so we, we, you know, getting consistent uh, participation at the end of one semester, through the summer, and then through, the, through most of the ne uh, fall semester is a challenge because the growing season calendar and the academic calendar don't mesh. Um, and then Wayne State is made up of mostly commuting students and you know, they're all active in their churches and their, you know, their communities and getting them to participate after classes is a challenge. Um, and then there are some, some, you know, I mean, growing a garden requires one set of skills, running a farmer's market requires another set of skills, and so how do you, how do you engage students <coughs> who are staff to go to cross-cut those activities? So do you engage the community <coughs> to get you through those summer months? Um, because we're trying to build capacity on campus for our gardens especially, we are very mindful, um, uh, you know, it's for, it's for people on campus only. So otherwise, you know, once you open the door for community members, then where do you stop, right? You let someone in, then you can't say no to someone else. And so, so we've decided that, and it's not, it's not like we have a huge amount of garden space. We have three small gardens. So we've decided um, that, you know, because we want to grow capacity on campus, that those are gardens are meant for people who, are, who have an, a current association with Wayne State. Um, sometimes there'll be a group of a student who graduated in May and they just continue through the season. I mean, that's fine with us. Um, but, and then space and you know, resources. Funders want to fund community activities. They say, oh, you take care of stuff on campus, you know, and where, you know, where the campus is asking for money as well. So sometimes that is a challenge, just trying to match what you're trying to do in your goals with what, what the funders are willing to fund. So notwithstanding those challenges, I want to conclude by saying that uh, through a campus community collaborative, Seed Wayne, um, helps build uh, sustainable food systems through activities that, oh, I have this, uh, increase access to healthy food, and we do that in a variety of ways, through our gardens, through our farmer's market, through our Detroit Fresh Healthy Corner Stores program, that shorten uh, distances between producers and eaters, again, through a variety of ways. Um, in the garden, of course, the producers are the eaters, but through the farmer's market, you are talking directly to your farmer or through the people who who helped process your food, um, and also in terms of our um, hoop house uh, and, and all the activities we're supporting, we're reducing that distance. Uh, we're trying to build capacity uh, at multiple levels, inclu including, for example, our activities, educational activities targeted to individuals and households by increasing neighborhood capacity and business um, capacity by helping stores carry fresh fruits and vegetables and uh, increasing capacity of gardeners by helping them grow their own vegetables, and also through our policy work, increasing the capacity of the system um, as well. And then we, uh, tr we try to advance multiple community goals, uh, goals in public health, in economic development and health, in neighborhood vitality, in social justice, um, in improving ecological health, as well, and then in, in facilitating democratic decision making through, for example, work with the Food Policy Council. That's all I have, and then I'm supposed to show you that uh, slide as well. Um, so with that, my presentation is done. I'm happy to answer any questions you have.